it's a little bit more sensitive. Or it's just, uh, Recording in progress. And it slowly goes mm -hmm. Just arriving in a new room, so making sure all the technology is uh, is working. So I think some of you don't know uh, the organizers here. So happy Europe. We bring together the public, social, and corporate advising pro providers here in Brussels. So we are the voice, uh, which is fighting for decent housing for all and trying to. months around uh, cooperative housing. So what we see is that in many of the, the member states where we traditionally, so going back 30, 35, 40 years, had very strong membership. So if we think of, of Poland, Hungary, Czechia, we actually see a slow weakening of those structures. And they're actually very often leaving um, the housing arena are not so much seen as a solution by policymakers um, anymore in those countries. And then it's a very mixed picture because at the same time, we see a real revival in other member states. And we also see um, much more exchange. So the types of cooperatives that we might have seen in some member states for the last even hundred years are now popping up in others. So in general, we see a renewed conversation around housing in general, of course, because of the, the huge impact it is having on our societies because of the lack of affordable housing. So we are seeing a renewed appetite looking for solutions, people looking for their own solutions, communities looking for solutions, cities and countries. And uh, part of that renewed conversation is, of course, revolving around uh, cooperatives and community-led housing as part of the solution. So what we realized is that that we knew a lot of this in the Housing Europe office because we've been following, but that many of the new cooperatives coming up actually don't know that in other countries you have cooperatives that are working for over 100 years and still providing solutions. So we think there's much more need for a type of uh, networking, coming together, finding out, okay, what's the best legal structure? How does your financing work? What type of solutions are you finding for young people, for older people? So that's a little bit the, hello, you're welcome, come on in. <laughs> so our communications team, we're, we're working on bilaterally uh, also in another meeting. So this is a little bit the idea of today. It's um, really like a chat, a chat between those established cooperatives and uh, some of the new emerging ones to really see how we can find more synergies and help each other. And um, of course, we will also um, take some time to look at some concrete examples. So we will have indeed from Spain, Portugal, Italy, France, and Sweden, we will have some concrete examples of what cooperatives are doing in some cases, but also how countries are re trying to restart the movement, the cooperative movement. So we will have a chat around that with concrete examples. Then we will look to the key, <laughs> part of the key, that's the finance. So we're really happy that Christian Koenig from the European Federation of Building Societies should could come along. I don't think you're going to be able to answer all our questions and shut, um, sign the checks today. But indeed, it's one of the big problems facing existing established cooperatives that often they can't access the funding at European level, but also for emerging ones that have really good ideas, but they don't have the scale and the size to actually access finance. So again, it's going to, it's definitely part of the puzzle is that finance question. And Christian's going to shed a bit of light on that for us. And then 
of course, uh, it wouldn't be a meeting on cooperatives without representative one of our colleagues from Cooperatives Europe. So Lorenzo Navarro has come along. Uh, thanks a lot, Lorenzo. Uh, it's the first time we meet, indeed, um, in this context. And Lorenzo is going to remind us a little bit, okay, what, what's the EU saying about cooperatives? What, um, what financing is it making available? What way is it pushing the cooperative sector? So that will, we will wrap up just going back to the, to the EU and how the EU is treating the sector. And if we are fine, I know it's always a challenge to get the tech right when it's not your own office, <laughs> but um, we're going to kick off indeed with my colleague, um, the research director, Ali Petini from our observatory in Housing Europe. So, um, Alice has been putting together, and actually many of you have already received emails from her and have been sending her information. She's been putting together, let's say, an overview of the trends around cooperatives. So trying to capture some of the of what's happening on the ground in terms of indeed the larger, mature models, the newer ones. And she's going to give you an update of where she is with that briefing. And she will probably also remind you maybe to that there is an, still an opportunity to contribute to that briefing, which will be published in June, if I'm not mistaken. So please join. And at the same time, maybe our panelists will join as well. So you come up and join Luce so that we can then kick off the exchange. So please, uh, Martin Lilia is online. Maite Arondo, Vice uh, Chair of our Social Affairs Committee. Uh, Rosanna Zaccaria, so the president of our um, Italian cooperative member, and Michel Contar, uh, please join us as well, from the Cooperative Federation of our French member. So thanks a lot for coming today. And of course, Joao Carvalosa, who will come, sorry, I'm sure I'm not pronouncing either the first or the last name correctly. So Joao will give us um, an insight into what's happening in Portugal. I think Alice is going to pick up. Um... Uh, indeed, we'll, we'll kick off actually with the framing from Patricia Toya, who is who has recorded a key message from us. It's one of the most active yeah. members of the European Parliament when it comes to social economy and cooperatives. Hopefully the sound is working. The pleasure to. I would like to address you today and welcome you to this important initiative. I also would like to thank Housing Europe for organizing and for inviting me. I'm sorry, I was not able to be with you in person, but I really wanted to contribute as, as this event brings together two topics. I hold the very dear. One is the right to decent and affordable housing, and second is the crucial role of cooperatives in guaranteeing this right, and in general for their role in European policies. Let's st start with housing, a core priority for the SD group in the European Parliament. Housing is a fundamental right of every citizen, not a privilege. Without a place to call home, people live in the uncertainty. They cannot work, create a family, they cannot imagine and start building their future. It is not acceptable that within our Europe of prosperity and opportunities every day, thousands of families and thousands of the young European and uh, uh, women also struggle to find affordable and suitable accommodation, facing the harsh reality of increasing rents inadequate housing conditions and homelessness. It is a crisis that demands urgent attention and bold, bold, and bold solutions. 
and the cooperative housing must be a core part of our strategy moving forward. I have always been a strong supporter of the cooperative model, especially in my role of co-chair of our, the social economy intergroup. Back in 2013, I was the first promoter of a parliamentary resolution recognizing the essential role of cooperatives in the European economy and in European society. Over 10, 10 years later, I am glad to be able to say that the importance of the social economy to our prosperity and the well-being is no longer in question, is on the table. Thanks to you, as a pillar of our civil society, the uh, dedicated, thanks to the dedicated colleagues of uh, the intergroup, and above all, thanks to our commissioner, Nicola Schmidt. The cooperative model is recognized as a different way of making enterprises, one that is based in mutuality, solidarity, and democracy. These are the values we must put at the center of our economy economic welfare models. If we want to face current and future challenges, we must put people at the exactly. center, not as mere, mere individuals, but as part of a collective, a collectivity. The current legislature, I believe, has marked a new, longer overdue era for the social economy, with the, with the action plan, the council recommendation, the social economy gateway, and many more initiatives. Times are changing, but it is you, as stakeholders, that are the true engines of this change. I then invite you and encourage you in keep working in this direction, especially this year with the European Parliament election, so that we can truly achieve a Europe that is resilient and united, a Europe where nobody is left behind. I look very much forward to hearing about uh, the outcome of today's initiatives and stand ready to support the follow-up initiatives of the event. Thank you, and I wish you uh, all a fruit of discussion. I am sure it uh, will be a fruit of discussion with the hope of meeting you in all in person very, very soon. Thank you. Dear all, it's a pleasure to be able to address you today. <laughs> Perfect. Thanks a lot. And uh, thank you for being here this afternoon. Uh, and uh, glad to hear this encouraging uh, message from a, um, a prominent MEP. Um, so what I'm going to do is just to give you a brief overview of uh, an initiative, a uh, research initiative that we are carrying on um, with the Housing Europe Observatory. For those of you who don't know the observatory, especially those who are joining uh, online, uh, we are the, let's say, the research um, department within Housing Europe, uh, and we work on a number of uh, uh, different publications and reports. And uh, we thought uh, it was a, a, an especially good and strategic time to focus on the topic of housing cooperatives. So... Why? Uh, as a federation, we work across the sectors, of course. Um, so we have public cooperative and not cooperative, so we have profit housing providers within our network. Uh, but if we look more closely at the cooperative model, we estimate that about 20,000 uh, uh, local members of our members are indeed uh, housing cooperatives. Um, we have uh, cooperative members in uh, 12 countries, and we estimate that uh, they manage about uh, Six point eight million homes uh, um, across Europe. Uh, so it's um, a really significant uh, sector within uh, uh, our organization, Active Europe, or uh, the International um, uh, Cooperative uh, Alliance. Why uh, a report or why focusing on cooperatives uh, today? Uh, so, um, first of all, 
Um, we uh, believe that it's very uh, timely um, to bring uh, knowledge about the sector uh, from the sector. Uh, we already um, worked on a report uh, a long time ago when it was the European uh, year of COVID, and we were happy to hear the next year the UN has announced will be uh, the international. Europe cooperatives. So, uh, what uh, what best opportunity to, to take a closer look to this sector? Um, and also, um, uh, very important to mention uh, in terms of uh, time and opportunities, of course, the uh, EU elections this year. And um, we would like to, uh, as a federation, to bring together a reflection of what uh, added value this can mean uh, for the sector. So, in this report that we're working on, that will be published uh, in June, we try to take a look uh, at the different models of housing cooperatives with a, with a country uh, approach. So for uh, uh, the countries that uh, we're, we're studying, we have uh, um, so far uh, uh, 10 countries where we've already collected quite a significant amount of information. We look at the, the history and the different models of housing cooperatives, but we also try to question what is new uh, trends within the sector and the new challenges that uh, cooperatives are facing. And uh, while doing that, as Sorka mentioned uh, uh, in her introduction, we look at well-established models of housing cooperatives that are present in many countries, but we also want to try to uh, connect to new uh, and emerging uh, realities. So just to give you... Um, An idea um, here, just to give you an idea of what, uh, what the approach that we're taking, for instance, I put some information on the countries that will not be covered today uh, in the panel. We have countries like Germany with a very large cooperative sector with uh, more than uh, 2 million homes managed by housing cooperatives uh, in, in the rental um, format. We have Switzerland, uh, again, a strong model of housing cooperatives uh, in the rental sector uh, with uh, a significant aim for, from the public sector to support uh, not-for-profit and cooperative housing to become uh, even more important in the years to come. And uh, we also have countries, especially in the Nordic countries, where housing cooperatives are mainly um, a way to access uh, home ownership uh, with also a lot of innovation on many fronts, uh, including uh, uh, trying to uh, cater through new forms of tenures, but also um, becoming more and more uh, environmentally uh, sustainable. So this is just to give you an idea. We're also looking at countries uh, from across the board, from Southern to uh, Eastern Europe. And, um, Also, something that I wanted to mention is uh, that uh, we see uh, really um, a major increase uh, in the interest towards the cooperative model. I think I've been at Housing Europe for quite a, a while now, and over the last two years, we've received uh, an, like, uh, an amount of requests around housing cooperatives that we had never seen before. And I think this really witnesses uh, an increase in interest, interest towards this model, uh, also as a response to um, the uh, affordable housing crisis that we see uh, across Europe. And we will hear some examples today, and you will also include more in the briefing uh, of uh, um, new in, uh, models for housing cooperatives in Portugal, uh, in Spain, uh, also the use in some cases of um, 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 uh, European uh, cooperatives uh, as, a, as a legal form to spread the cooperative model across countries, especially in Southern, uh, Eastern and uh, Central Eastern Europe. So just to conclude, um, and also as an introduction to our panelists uh, today, uh, we believe that the added value of this model uh, is uh, especially uh, in terms of affordability and stability of housing tenure, so for people who live uh, in, in uh, housing cooperatives and associations. It's also a uh, resilience. Uh, cooperatives have a really long history in uh, most of the countries where they uh, are present, but they're also responsive, meaning that because of the democratic uh, because they're really based on the interest of their members, they can evolve and offer additional services 
and according to the local needs. Uh, democratic and bottom-up, which is really typical of this model and other collaborative housing uh, uh, approaches. And uh, of course, the principle of solidarity and uh, cooperation uh, across uh, sectors, so also with other um, <coughs> of the social economy. And I will maybe conclude here uh, and leave the floor to the national and local examples that we will hear more about today. Thank you. So we will keep up with the issue. Yes. Gosh. Okay, we will actually start with the person who's who's not in the room. Uh, Martin Lilia, as your board member, will tune in from Sweden, from Riksbögen. So hopefully she was online. Yes. Yeah. Hi, Martin. Hello, can you hear me? We can. <laughs> we can, good. Um, can you see me? That's another question. <laughs> We're working on it. I think it's just... I, I think yeah, I have the possibility to turn my microphone on, but not my video because you have closed it. Ah, okay. But I think if you can, um, we will work on that. And if you want to to start, I'm sure we will find a solution. Yes. Um, thank you for the presentation, Alice, about... Uh, uh, the uh, opportunity not all not only for cooperatives but for the society as a whole um, because cooperatives represents uh, many uh, good ideas that we really need in this time of social unrest and and other problems in our societies uh, since they are uh, based on uh, ideas of democracy and um, uh, social inclusiveness. Uh, I would like to show you a video. I hope that will work. And it's a, an example of how we in Riksbyggen, uh, which is the cooperative organization in Sweden uh, I do represent. Riksbyggen is a federation of housing cooperatives and we manage uh, mostly the, the, tenant, uh, the, the um, ownership model uh, as uh, represented earlier, but also the tenant uh, and we have a special um, uh, special concept of cooperatives for elderly or uh, senior citizens, and uh, I uh, and that's a result of our own ideas, but also it's put on the market in cooperation with uh, most uh, often uh, small municipalities all around Sweden, and um, uh, I try to uh, show you. Uh, did you now? Yes. yes, okay, we're going to just try and connect the video. And indeed, this issue of, of aging and people being able to age in dignity at home, we've heard yes. it, many of our, our members, it's one of the key problems um, coming up, yes. having the right size of accommodation and the right combination with care and with health services. Exactly, and uh, in my opinion, uh, an experience. I think many senior citizens, they tend to stay too long time in an ordinary house before they move to a more um, better place, a better, uh, better home for them. And when they finally do that, uh, there will be uh, ordinary homes uh, free on the market for younger households and younger people. So that's very good for the, um, for the municipality as a whole. <laughs> Making sense for the person themselves, but also for the for the housing plan. So yes. the news is now we, we see you perfectly. Now the next challenge is if we can launch this short video. That... Ah, you will share it from your side. Okay. I try. Yes, great. Let's try it. <laughs> Let's take the risk. Does it work? Not yet. Man är fri. Man är inte så man har kontakt med hem. Jag tycker att det här boendet blev jätte jättebra. Nästan lite bättre. Här ska det vara förskläsigt. Det är ju vårt syfte. Jag känner att jag är trygg. Att jag 
fortfarande kan göra det. Jag vill inte nu som en god. Yes, now yes. Det är ju ett kooperativt hyreslättsföreningsmåte och vi är det ju. Och så måste du dela på något vis. Ja. Ja. Okay. I think if you press play again, it should. Okay. Uh, uh, did you did you see it from the beginning? No, we missed a little bit at the start. So. Okay. <clears throat> and we try again. Okay. Man är ju fri, men det är inte som man vore på något sorts hem. Jag tycker att det här boendet blev jätte, jättebra, nästan lite bättre än jag hade tänkt. Mm. Här ska det vara förstklassigt, det är ju vårt syfte. Jag känner att jag är, att jag fortfarande kan göra det jag vill förutom att gå. Detta är ett kooperativt hyreslättsföreningsboende och vi är lyrda. Och försöker och svara upp mot de önskemål som kommer fram. Kontakten med de boende, det är ju oerhört viktigt. Och vi har också representanter från en boende som sitter i styrelsen. Fördelarna med det kooperativa boendet tycker jag är att man har en helt annan möjlighet att samarbeta. Man har korta beslutsvägar. Här har man kunnat vara delaktig hela vägen. Det har funnits en lyhördhet för det behov vi har haft i huset. Vi har en personal som är enorm. Jag är så glad för nu har jag ju fått nya vänner som kan vara barnbarn till mig allihop. Och det tycker jag är så härligt. Vi vill vara med och skapa möjligheter till aktiviteter. Därför har vi lagt väldigt stor möda på både interiören och även exteriören då. Det är en väldigt fin eh, trädgårdsanläggning på utsidan. Den är väldigt tillgänglig. Äntligen så har vi fått ett boende som är på marken. De flesta lägenheter ligger med utgång ut i trädgård. Man har en autonomi. Man kan gå utanför dörren utan personalhjälp. Dit kommer jag ju ut och kan sitta. Och det tycker jag är väldigt skönt. Och så odlar vi ju lite grann. Och där. Jag fick så mycket tomater. Vet du? Vi hade ju tomater på hela avdelningen. <laughs> det finns inga korridorer eller så utan för den äldre som bor här så kommer man ut i ett vardagsrum kan man säga. Så man känner sig aldrig vilsen eller ensam. Jag är stolt att föreningen har lyckats med det uppdraget man hade. Vi fick en väldigt fin fastighet i den verksamheten som bedrivs här. Det är lugnt och tryggt. Om inte det kooperativa alternativet hade funnits så tror inte jag att vi hade haft Fiskbäck i den skepnad det är idag. Well, thank you Martin. Would you like to follow up with a few comments? Yes, uh, first, uh, did you have any sound? We did, yes. Yeah, good. Then you perhaps uh, catch up some Swedish, uh, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, just, uh, I think this is a very good example of what the cooperatives uh, can achieve. Uh, the, the cooperative Rick Spiegel, we uh, managed the, the, the cooperative uh, administ administration and the building and personnel from the municipality take care of the persons that uh, the, the elderly that are living in, in the cooperative. So example of the, the, the people living in this house, they can, they also have um, a democratic uh, influence because they are take part in the board and so on. And then the competence of Rick Spiegel uh, is uh, uh, doing a very good result in cooperation also with the municipality. And uh, Martin, I would like to just, before we, we move on to the next example, I think it could be nice just to give a few moments if there's any comments or questions about the scheme from the people here in the room. Or of course, we have 30 people online as well. And um, just, I know that we might forget some of the details when we hear all of the presentations together. I don't know if there's some questions 
or something you would like to ask Martin while we have him? And Dara? Shout to her. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I would actually just kick off as well while I do have the microphone and ask if you are developing intergenerational housing as well. Intergenerational? You mean um, no, it, just ordinary building, ordinary, um, no, not specifically, but we have um, uh, specific cooperatives for, for young people. If if you that what what you were after, and then of course we have cooperatives for young people in the same area and so on as uh, other more ordinary homes. Okay, good to know. Okay, Dara, if you have. Yeah, hi. Um, I was speaking at a conference in Ireland uh, two weeks ago where they're really struggling at the moment because they they really put up a basket and that basket was called uh, Build to Rent private for-profit uh, apartments by large international investors. And I, I said to them, I think you need to look at Sweden. I think the cooperative model for Sweden could help you to, to unlock uh, hidden potential, let's say, particularly accessing funds from, from corporate banks who currently are not basically lending for, for new construction. And the reason they don't lend is they have no collateral from the people who wish to build their, their home. So I'm wondering, I know in Sweden, the corporate sector is underpinned by this guarantee fund that you that you brought up at Wittsbergen and also HSB. Um, how solid is that uh, is that fund? Um, and how frequent is it that you actually need to step in and, and uh, compensate financial institutions for loans, for mortgages that are not repaid and so on? Uh, well, um, I'm sorry to tell you that that fund is not uh, longer existing. Uh, it was a, a cooperation between HSB and Rigsbing for some years ago, and um, but uh, it were out of date, so to speak. Uh, and now we have other models, uh, other methods to secure the uh, the new construction of uh, cooperative housing. So um, in fact, uh, we have to take the risk ourselves in uh, the federation of Riksbyggen. So when we create a new cooperative housing, uh, uh, we make an agreement with a, uh, with a cooperative that are under construction that those apartments, uh, which may be not sold uh, Rick Spigen will uh, uh, will buy them up. So the the local cooperative are secured in the finance situation, and uh, the risk is taken in Rick Spigen. And we have uh, we have a situation where we can manage all those. Uh, we do not start any new construction projects without being secure that we can also fulfill our. Uh, commitments to the local uh, new housing cooperatives. And so far uh, in the history of speaking, we have had no, um, what you call it, uh, crash in, in, in a local uh, housing cooperative. Thanks a lot. I think you... Thanks a lot. You reinforced indeed the point made by Alicia on the stability and also by the, by the MEP. Um, so we're going to jump to a very different context now. And um, Maite Arondo is going to give us uh, some insight into what local authorities can do indeed to reinforce um, cooperative housing and, and community-led housing. So, okay. Hello. Good. Hello. Okay. Good afternoon. May I have uh, my presentation? Thank you. Pass through the slides. Okay. Well, first of all, I introduce myself. This is the first time I attend this housing group committees uh, as vice chair of the social uh, working group and also presenting this project that I uh, was involved. Uh, years ago, uh, when I was working uh, on my personal <laughs> uh, or 
for Barcelona municipality. I'm now the housing director general of Navarra, which is a region in, in Spain, just below the Basque country. And I'm now responsible for housing. And we just, as Navarra, we have joined this network recently. So this is sort of a project I, it's very close to, to me in a sense. Okay, this this project responds to a need, especially from cities and regions back then, that we found when uh, we were working on uh, setting up a collaborative housing program in Barcelona municipality, that we saw like the projects and initiatives were very actively in exchanging and learning from each other, but public officials, uh, staff from municipalities and people working at the local level, that we're lagging behind in, in some extent in this exchange and learning from other experiences across Europe. So the project uh, was uh, uh, originally an idea that came up in a meeting at Eurocities, the housing working group of Eurocities, uh, when we all cities participates and were asking the same questions and, and so on. So we created and we uh, presented back then as Barcelona, the network of cities uh, for collaborative housing to, that is integrated by now it's 17 cities across Europe. Navarra regional government also uh, joined recently and many other cities and regions have approached with the same need to exchange and learn that from the public sector uh, side, how to design, what were the challenges and opportunities to set up these programs, where were the, which were the models behind, and the funding schemes, the legal framework, the policies, and the targets that were uh, at the core of these different, very different programs. Um, uh, as you can see, we have, uh, well, I think there are a couple of points missing in that map, but anyway, <laughs> as you can see, there is a wide variety and uh, actually diversity is, is mostly the, the common trend within all these cities. Uh, this is the the last addition, as I explained by the Navarra regional government, where now uh, we want there from Navarra to launch a regional program to support collaborative one would be affordable housing, mostly directed to young people and, and vulnerable communities for senior housing for senior people and also in rural areas. That would be, uh, I, uh, we hope by the end of, the, of this year, become, uh, uh, in, become uh, a law <laughs> at the, and pass at the regional government. And we may have one of the most advanced, at least in Spain, uh, legal framework in, in this sense. Uh, uh, what was clear, uh, exchanging and learning from uh, different cities and regions uh, within this network was that somehow, uh, and also there was a common question discussed in the two main events that happened uh, last year. This, this was the European Network of Housing Research and also the International Social Housing Festival that both took place in Barcelona. That this was a trendy topic, <laughs> and that somehow many people was approaching uh, with fresh air, so to say, and with very big demands and expectations to the topic of collaborative housing, thinking that it was a magic box that was going to fix everything. And uh, also civil society had very high expectations, thinking that they was going to fill in the gaps that uh, and meeting the needs that public sector could not reach and uh, and that we needed to, to open a definition and keep it wide so um, cities uh, were uh, could come and, and felt that they will could fit in. As Salice, you explained before, there was a, a in the recent years we, we we witnessed that there was a sort to say a third way for a third generation of cooperatives going on across uh, Europe and uh, the main characteristics of uh, of these uh, new initiatives were that they were uh, putting very high in their agendas the topics of environmental sustainability, but also mostly permanent affordability and their link with social and affordable housing. 
uh, uh, this analysis has been very well put in a, in in terms of data by the Delft University in the Netherlands with a project project uh, uh, led by Darinka. I cannot pronounce her surname. <laughs> okay, uh, there where they are mapping now all the projects going on in Europe. Just for these countries in the map, there are more than one thousand nine hundred. Uh, projects that have, uh, have been appearing in this lately with these characteristics. And just in the case of Spain, we have also many other examples just that have been uh, appearing lately. And it's a pity because in the region of Catalonia is where they are mostly most active and they don't are not in that map. Well, this uh, network called NETCO, the acronym, uh, was focused on exchanging and had site visits to different cities where they had the chance to present their collaborative housing programs and learn from each other from the perspective of the legal framework. Then uh, there was a plan to visit to Bologna. Also, uh, there was a visit to Barcelona. They focused on social and affordable housing through collaborative housing. We also visited uh, Berlin to approach and learn from the funding schemes of collaborative housing there. And also to Brussels here that we came uh, just recently to many cases and examples that of collaborative housing projects with a very strong social impact. Um, with, within this uh, network, the, uh, there was presented, actually it's going to be presented on the 23rd of April in the streaming, by the way, uh, the conclusions, the report that will come along with the best practices and lessons learned and recommendations towards cities and the European Union. And there was a, there is a collaborative among cities <laughs> definition of what it means, collaborative housing in terms of this third wave of, of co-housing going on in Europe. And we widened the definition to include social and affordable housing mostly the intention and the requirement by, by cities. Um, as I'm not planning to go through all of them, but just to explain that within these two years long that we have been working on the, all these group of cities and regions, uh, we have elaborated and we will present a set of recommendations directed to different levels of, of government, of, poly, of decision makers, and also to the European Union. And uh, this is the web page in case you want to, to check and, and learn from the previous experiences. And uh, now we are just about to finish this uh, EU project. Uh, in April, we will have the online uh, seminar. You are all invited. Use the uh, links and contacts to check and register. And that we are just now a group of core cities within this network planning how to set up and continue this work because we have been permanently approached by all the cities with the same intention and needs to carry on their um, um, Actually, it was clear that from city practitioners and at local level and regional level, there was a, also a very strong interest in, in this regard. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think so please, uh, we will have space a little bit uh, later for questions. Also, for those following online, please um, take a note of your questions. And I think it just illustrates indeed what was pointed out and what we've seen in the briefing, that there's a renewed interest from cities, from citizens and from countries. And, um, and I think... Indeed, this need for networking is even more clear because we've just heard from, from Martin Lilia about this very effective and sustainable model, which perhaps is, is your network is not informed enough about. And the same, uh, our next speaker, so Rosana Zakaria, president of Lega Coupe Habitante, will also inform from one of the, the let's say, mature housing cooperative systems. If you don't mind, I, I stand up. Please. It'll be easier for me. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Rosan. Just a little bit. Yeah. So thanks a lot to Housing Europe for inviting me, but also for I mean thinking about the, this session on cooperatives, uh, as Sorha says in, in her said in her introduction, there is a sort of new conversation uh, with the cooperative model, also with the I would say, uh, as she said, as as Alicia mentioned, with the um, 
traditional and mature cooperative models, but also with the new ones. So I have a short presentation. I think that just to introduce the, the point, I was thinking about that uh, Commissioner Schmidt uh, some weeks ago said that about what should come in the next years for the new housing policies, uh, public-private partnership are uh, crucial. Uh, and I would say that cooperatives are uh, a part of, of these private non-speculative actors that can be important for this for designing the new policies at European levels. Mm -hmm. So I was asked a little bit to, to say something about uh, one of <coughs> our practices and uh, mainly about uh, young uh, young people and some an example about, housing model for young people. So yes, I will go through very shortly. So very briefly, uh, Lega Copa Abitanti is the national association of housing cooperatives in Italy, uh, around 600 cooperatives. And uh, what is important for us is to say that we have more than 250,000 uh, members. Uh, still 14, uh, 40,000 uh, units of undivided ownership um, and uh, more than uh, 10,000 units that uh, we manage for other social housing operators. And of course, I didn't mention here, but uh, more than uh, 300,000 um, uh, um, uh, housing in ownership. Uh, so the, the point uh, about young adults and what we call the housing dream, um, what is the problem in Italy now at present is that uh, more than two thirds of young adults are living um, with their parents because they cannot afford independent accommodation. Uh, it is important to underline that 40% of these people uh, are workers. And what is very difficult um, is uh, overcome, overcoming the transition from student uh, to, to status to work. Uh, this phase lasts much longer than it should. Uh, and 40% of young people have low wages and strong discontinuity. This, I think this is quite uh, an, an issue uh, in, in a lot of European countries. So uh, the analysis uh, that we did as cooperatives uh, um, around the issue of housing and the young people is that uh, uh, the exclusion causes are not only uh, uh, an issue of economic accessibility, of course, this, this is one of the most important, but also the what we call the rigidity in the housing offer, so the format. Of, of the housing offer and the lack and the lack of a system of guarantees um, that should be aimed at favoring a structurally this precarious target of, of people. And uh, according to us, this is very typical of our cooperative approach to problems, is that uh, the social management model of um of housing for for young people is is crucial and is is essential uh the approach of, of one of the best practices I, I will present very shortly is that uh for young people we think that affordable uh, and temporary housing is needed uh which allows mobility and change but which is something very different from a proca precarious uh, housing, and then to consider housing as a possibility of informal learning. And uh, what we what we mean by informal learning is to create living settings that promote autonomy, and uh, networks, relationship, emancipation, social mobility. That is alternative uh, to buying a home. So we stress a lot the concept of rental housing in general, and for young people, uh, of course. Um, and uh, housing that is an opportunity of inclusion, community-driven processes, social engagement of young people. Um, and uh, so I was asking today to some of Housing Europe members about intergenerational 
uh, approaches and housing formats. We we believe this is uh, the vision we have to have for the future, not only housing for elderly or for uh, young people, but really intergenerational formats of housing. So uh, this is one practice that uh, shows how the cooperative model in Italy is working a lot on the uh, public-private partnership. Uh, in this case, uh, uh, this is a cooperative that has um, uh, realized the project of uh, retrofitting of uh, public housing, um, public temporary housing, uh, where here the the um, let's say one of the the main uh, issues and added value of the project is that we have a um, social mix. So the target here is families in housing um, emergency, uh, together with young students and temporary workers, together with young people with more fragile profiles. So as I said. Um, uh, the added value of this pro uh, of this project is the uh, uh, We have uh, twenty young people aged between uh, twenty and thirty five of eight different nationalities. Uh, Fifty percent are Italian. This is the price you see. So really uh, affordable. And then uh, thirty two families of fourteen different uh, nationalities. <laughs> So social mix uh, and in intergenerational uh, approach. Of course, here, um, uh, as I said, the, it is quite important uh, the the social management uh, that is in charge uh, by the cooperative. But uh, what is important is the tenants' engagement. So the project asks to young people to get involved in relationship with neighbors and with neighborhoods. Uh, and there is a social team that follows the young inhabitants in, in this uh, challenge. Um, so just to, to end my presentation and uh, going back to the point I, uh, I touched in, in my introduction, is that uh, we think that uh, mutualism is something that can give a uh, huge value to the future of the housing policies um, uh, in Europe. And what we are, let's say, observing is that uh, young people uh, is is um, again coming to the to the door of the even to the to the mature. Uh, system of cooperatives in Italy, uh, they were they are quite curious because they see it as a, a possible response to the, this housing crisis, a possible response to their desire of uh, 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 let's say self organization uh, setting and uh, of response, but. Uh, based on an on a mature and stable and affordable and resilient system. Um, thanks. Thank you, Rostana. Really inspiring. As we spoke, I was saying, we hear increasingly, even from Commissioner Schmidt, that market is not going to solve the problem, and this mutualism approach and relying this um, reliance on each other, I think. Uh, is definitely part of the puzzle. We're going to move to France now. I'm really curious to hear from Michel Gontard. Uh, please, you're going to tell us a little bit about the recent developments around community land trust in France. Thank you. Hi, everybody. I'm probably you immediately find that I'm not from the north of France, but from the south of France. <laughs> I gave you a few words about my federation first, and then about my cooperative to explain why I'm here. I'm a member of the board of uh, the social housing for cooperatives. Uh, we uh, represent 174 cooperatives working in France, as well on rental apartment, as well on uh, uh, just a check, how you say it in English, <laughs> it's uh, own, yes, it's own 
apartments or own houses. Uh, my cooperative I am president is called Candel Tabita. We are running 40,000 apartments in the south of France. And since a while now, we are promoting uh, what we call uh, in English a community land trust, but with a French touch. <laughs> of course. <laughs> I will explain what is this with you. In fact, uh, in the metropolitan area, as well as in the touristic uh, region, it's quite hard and very hard for people uh, to get uh, home owners. And uh, for this, we work with the Federation to give a special touch to this uh, community land trust. And we have to use the word in French, which is uh, uh, the uh, organism Forestier Solidaire. Uh, the organism Forestier Solidaire is an instrument that we developed now since uh, five or six years in France. And uh, is similar, as I said, to the Community Land Trust uh, in English. Uh, we found it uh, in the South, the first uh, office Forestier Solidaire, and uh, is called uh, the Cooperative Forestier Mediterranean. Uh, we are working on all the Mediterranean French seaside, including in the interland, and uh, we are four cooperatives associated in this organism to provide this kind of solution. It's a very uh, social housing scheme based on the land lease that is attracting more and more household thanks to its low price. Buyer acquire only the building and the property of the land is retained by the organism. This translates into saving for residents that go from 20 to 50 percent down to the, to the price for the land like uh, the French Riviera, for example. By the time we are talking, my cooperative is currently marketing 34 homes, which are 28 apartments and six detached homes. These properties are being offered at 3,320 euro square meters, which is in fact, 25% below the market price. In return, the owner pays monthly a fee of one euro and 63 cents square meters for the organism. Uh, this town where we do uh, this program today is Lille sur la Sorgue. Lille sur la Sorgue is a very touristic city close to Avignon. And it's quite impossible for young people, including also people not having enough resources to own an apartment or a house in this area. We uh, do this same kind of program on the French Riviera. I give you another example we are working now with uh, the municipality of Villeneuve, which is on the Côte d'Azur. And we can provide houses, in fact, 48% down the price here in the area of the Côte d'Azur. This is because we use, in, effective, in fact, the office of Foncier Solidaire. This mechanism is only way that low income Households can buy their own home in areas where market price do not allow them to do so. It was at the beginning quite difficult to introduce uh, this kind of tools in the mind of the people because we are in the south of France, as well in Italy, as well in Spain. People want to be owning by their own property, the house and the land. And it's not 
quite impossible uh, to uh, explain, to divide it, this one building on the other side of the land. And so I give to my teams this kind of tips. I said, explain to the people this. They are buying a mobile home and they want to have a set on a camping on the Riviera for the year. What they do, they are owning the camping, so, I mean, their mobile home, but they have to pay each month to the owner of the camping, in fact, money for be sure to uh, have the place. And in fact, then if they want, they can return their camping, not in another place, but they can sell it or they can give it to their kids. And uh, these tips is working pretty good in the area to explain uh, how uh, to promote, in fact, uh, this uh, tool to provide owner the solution to have a house or to have an apartment in this very, uh, very, very dense areas. Most important, this cooperative uh, schemes is anti-speculative. The capital gain on which sale is controlled and the owner must be approved by the OFS, by the organism, which applies income selling, a condition for benefiting from the solution of the organism. Yes, the problem is that when we talk with uh, municipalities, I have been electing during uh, almost 30 years as the first deputy mayor in Avignon, my hometown. Uh, the, the municipality are ready to accept this. But what they want, as well we want in cooperative, is that people don't have a speculative, in fact, solution in finding this. Imagine that we buy in Lille sur Sorgue at almost 3,000 euro square meters. In Lille sur Sorgue, you can sell this kind of houses six, seven, eight thousand square meters. So uh, we have locked the system and the people are, have to say effective, effectively to, to other owners, which also have the same kind of on tax ceiling mm -hmm. to protect this social solution. But, uh, Last but not least, homes offers under this proposal are including in the social housing quota for the local authority under what we call in France the SRU law. Uh, this is also a very important, in fact, French touch on this system. In France, every municipality have to provide and between 25 to 30 percent of their stock as social housing. The system we provide with the Office Foncier Solidaire is that we are included in this quota. So, in fact, the municipalities are appreciating this kind of solution because they provide, in fact, as well houses, as well apartments at a low price for people who are not able to buy it if they don't have the opportunity of this solution. Therefore, our schemes represent a significant advantage for the hosting municipality, as I hope having explaining you quite fair, but you will tell me through your questions. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you. Just uh, last position. Mm -hmm. If you come in the South, 
who can visit us who have the shades to receive you. Go. Yes, and, uh, the best way to learn and indeed see in person. I think you've touched on some really key points, obviously tourism, uh, over tourism, on sustainable tourism in Europe is really ex exacerbating the, the housing crisis in many parts. And indeed, also the key point of, of changing people's expectations because uh, this is what we are seeing models in Europe in the different member states, most of them have remained static for many, many, many decades. So the idea of shifting people's expectations of what they expect from a home is a crucial one. So it's really here, interesting to hear from you, your practical experience talking with people on the ground. Great, thanks a lot. We're going to hear from, from Joao from Gebalis, um, Lisbon's public housing provider of the reality in, in in Portugal before we move on to look at the, the finance. So, Joao, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much, Sorka. Uh, well, uh, my name is... I come from uh, the municipal um, uh, company that manages social housing in Lisbon. And what I will present is the, the Lisbon strategy to, to make the reborn of the cooperatives um, in Lisbon. Um, just show you before that this is uh, how how the timeline of the cooperatives in the last uh, thirty years or fifty years. Sorry. So after the revolution, there was uh, uh, a program that was started um, uh, with, uh, with that uh, the, the 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 municipality will give the the land, and then there will be like a, a support from architects and from students to 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 make the projects that where people would live so it's like a, a very communal communal thing uh, so it's with like people architects students everybody together like in, a, in almost in an assembly uh, uh, trying to 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 plan it and then we we the the, the next steps were to, well this program ended and then the next steps were to to make uh, uh, cooperatives that had an agreement with the municipality. So there, there were two agreements in 1990 and the, in the beginning of the, of the 2000 years. Um, this was made with the National Federation. The agreement was, was made with the National Federation for Cooperatives, and then the National Co Federation would uh, distribute, let, let's say like this, the, the, the number of, of, uh, of permits within the, 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 the cooperatives that were members. The, the objective was to to build um, about um, four thousand uh, and two hundred uh, uh, dwellings. Well, we did we didn't reach the, the objective. The, the, the cooperatives didn't, re didn't reach the objectives, mainly because of the mod of the model of the cooperatives that were just like built to sell. So they didn't rent. Most of the almost every units were sold to, to the tenants. Um, and of course, this ended when the there was the crisis in two thousand eight, the, the the housing crisis in two thousand eight. Is they act like private developers, let's say like that, but in a lower price. So when the when the the crisis come, all most of the com of the cooperatives went bankruptcy, because they were used to like uh, buy and sell, buy and sell, buy and sell. When when there was no money to to for the 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 people to put money in the cooperative, they fall and they they went bankruptcy so most of them disappear nowadays there's just one or two um, um making something very just real uh, short thing so the, the municipality has this problem well how can we uh, make new cooperatives how can we give a new a new life to this to this uh, um sector the, the the municipality is acting now in a strategy, the housing strategy, in uh, using the the land that the municipality has. It has cap capacity to build about seven thousand units, so it's public land owned by the municipality that can be built. These units can be built either by municipalities, either by by the by concessions or by cooperatives. So the idea is is to give the the big plots. Like 100, 200, 300, and plus uh, units in a concession uh, to build. So uh, uh, always in an in a accessible uh, way, uh, and the small plots to the to these new cooperatives that the, the municipality is trying to to organize. Okay, um, if we think about the, the, this, uh, the, this is a big plan. As I, again, as I said to you. Um, the municipality is planning to invest until 2028 800, 800 million euros 
in housing. So it's it's uh, a major investment. Um, most of them are 500 millions coming from the the European funds, and 300 millions it's it's money from the municipality. Um, well, but the pro of, of course we have a, a big problem in in Lisbon, as you probably know. Lisbon is nowadays one of the most expensive cities to rent a house and to buy a house. Just to, to give you a number, uh, nowadays in, the, in February, the the price of selling a, a house in square meters in Lisbon was five thousand five hundred thirty eight per, per square meter. So if you consider that the Portuguese minimum income is around 800 euros and the average income is about 1,100 euros, you can see that most of, of the of the of the houses are not accessible to, to for, for people to buy it or to rent nowadays, especially in Lisbon. Um, if you consider this 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 value nowadays, so 5,500 euros. If you, if you look at 2015, so nine years ago, it was 2000. So it's more than the double of the price into that was just nine years ago. So um, what are, in, we're very short, what are we doing now? So as I told you, the big plots are not in this, in this presentation. So we are pro projecting five uh, cooperatives so five uh, plots of land, and so this is the city of Lisbon. It's not a big city, as you as you know it. Um, and as you can see, it's just small uh, uh, units. And what the municipality is doing? Well, mainly, and to be very short, uh, municipality will give the land. Well, not give. It's uh, it's um, um, I would say um, it's a, a, a right to use. So people, the cooperative will have the right to use for 90 year, years the, the land, so they can build on it. And the municipality will give the projects, will give, will give everything just like, uh, just build it. So here's the project, we've made it, we made everything for you. You just have to get money to build the houses. Okay, so mainly it's this. Uh, you have to, of course, you have to build it in, uh, According to the, to the laws of the cooperative, so it, it has some some limitations on the on the areas, of course. But that's not a problem for for people come because it's the municipality who prepares everything, so it's according to the law, uh, and it's already approved by municipality. So it's absolutely just get the cons the construct the company construct to construct it, and it's it's yours. Um, <coughs> So to be, to be very quick, um, the, there are just some rules, of course. Um, you people have to 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 the income of the people have to be according to the what we, our other programs for uh, accessible housing. So if you are a rich person, you cannot uh, apply to these cooperative uh, uh, houses. Um, and uh, well, and there. There will be like if there are more than one cooperative that is forming to 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 get this these projects, it will be like a, a punctuation system, a scoring system to then to find who will get the that plot and, and that can build. And the 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 only compensation that municipal the, the city wants is that they can give an, a social area on the building for some social pur purpose. Okay. That can be can be after it managed by the cooperative or by the municipality or by other social entity. So mainly it's this. I just well, if I think you and the slides have all the information. So let me just pass and just show you one of the. Um, and then you have, of course, the, the the fees. So this like this is like administrative fees that you would have if you were a, a, a private developer and then put the project into the municipalities it's a lot of money here and then you also the it's it's um, it will be exempt for most of the taxes you only have to pay the tva which is a reduced tax of six percent so it's a, a lot of uh, advantage and just to show you oh, sorry no, it's not seen there okay no problem so this is one just the the one that it's ready to to launch it will be launched in uh, june uh, so it's 18 units, uh, 22 um, 
a, a parking uh, slot or cars. Um, so it's a total cost of three to seven million. Um, and this is uh, the average cost for uh, per unit. If you can see here the prices of, of, the, of the houses, of course, it's very, very cheap for, for Lisbon. And this will be like the, the project that the municipality is preparing. So we, we hope that then that this model works. Of course, the, the, now the, everything is done. So the only difficulty is to get is to get sure that the banks finance the families to join this cooperative. That is new cooperatives. Thank you. Thank you, Joel. One clarification: We have home ownership cooperatives. Yes, and they can be sold on the the market. No, sorry. It will, it will be both models. There will be uh, home ownership and rental. Uh, um, uh, and they can be sold uh, just by the price plus inflation. Okay, so it's a little bit similar to the community land trust going in that direction. Thank you very much. And now I'm really happy to join. At, I think if we can all stay because there will be some time for questions afterwards. Um, but now we welcome Christian Koenig. Uh, Managing Director of European Federation of Building Societies, just to hear um, one approach. Uh, if we can all stay there, because there will be some questions afterwards. Um, um, obviously, not there's no one size fits all when it when it comes to um, housing cooperatives in different regions. There will be different um, needs. So we are not pretending that uh, we will have the answer, Christian, to to all of the new and upcoming cooperatives. However, I think it's um, it's great to, to have your intervention now. So I'll ask you to join uh, my colleagues at the table, or if you prefer to stay standing, whichever you want. Sitting all day, thank you. Sitting all day, so yeah, stay standing, yes. So thank you very much for having me, Sokal. Thank, thank you very you. much for the invitation. Thank you very much for learning your great experience from all over Europe. Um, my name is Christian Koenig. I'm sitting on the other side. Thank you. Yeah. Here. So my name is Christian Koenig, I'm the European I'm the managing director of the European Federation of Building Societies. Building Societies, you know it from England, Ireland, but you also know it from Germany, also from Eastern Europe, Savetnis Politerna and Czech are in Hungary. So may I ask you who is from from Eastern Europe? So let's say Czech Republic, Slovakia, Romania, Croatia. Okay. Uh, probably you haven't heard about this banking system. We are um, representing at the European level credit institutions who are focusing on housing finance. So what is common with you is that we finance our loans by a cooperative funding. So therefore I have a presentation somewhere. Um, and I will not go through every page because it's a little bit boring reading what we wrote down. So I will explain a little bit more about um, what is behind, what is our business structure. We are, of course, we are banks, so we are doing profit. We are supposed to do profit, but we are not doing profit like Deutsche Bank or Bank or BNP Paribas. Because we have a social focus, we are here for helping lower and middle income. Oh, thank you. Lower and middle income to get credit to purchase a property, to purchase apartments, to purchase a house, or to purchase even a cooperative share, or to even fix and renovate the existing housing stock, which is also one of the biggest challenges which we have to face. If you look around here in Brussels, you can see the buildings here, they really necessarily needed to be renovated. So uh, this is the biggest part of our... <laughs> I'm not talking about Belgium. I mean, this is uh, all over Europe. Some countries are better off than others. So what we do is, as I said, we um, I'm, I'm a lobbyist based in Brussels, not far from here. So I'm, I'm negotiating with the European Commission and the Parliament uh, banking law. But my main focus on national level is to promote housing policy, how we are able to get people into homes. <laughs> Let it be rental homes, let it be ownership, uh, but this is the main important, most important thing. We all suffer from high high housing prices and um, the inflation, and you all know the problems. People don't have enough place to live. People from Italy right now, we heard that you're staying at home not because of the good food, but also because of the lack of existing housing. <laughs> so we need to offer something for the young generation to, be, um, to get out from the parents' house and also to have their own property, their own wealth, and to create a new family. So, which is really important, as you can see now, as it is the age of, 
of people who become first time owners, for example, in Germany is 38, 39 years. So this is quite old. And if you think about it, and you want to have a family and uh, you have to pay off your credits until retirement, it is often impossible. Therefore, a lot of people are not getting credits anymore. And we have the situation that we had 10 years low interest rate or negative interest rate, the European Central Bank, uh, the negative interest rates where people didn't save. People didn't save money to become homeowners. People didn't they spend all the money, which was the purpose of the um, of the European Central Bank's policy that people should not save. They should consume in order to encourage the economy, which means that people haven't don't have any resources, don't have their own capital. If they decide now, when you are thirty, to buy a property or to you become homeowner, it doesn't need to be a house. It also can be an apartment. Can be a cooperative share. So what uh, our member banks are mostly in Eastern Europe, Germany and Eastern Europe, but the French know the Parle Logement, uh, Le Compte de Parle Logement, which is a similar product, uh, what we offer, saving, and then you get a credit. And since I said we are a collective closed fund scheme, cooperative financed, we grant credits to people who have been saving with us before. The idea was established in the United Kingdom, um, more than 100 years ago, the first building society, Catholic building society, somewhere in nowhere of England. Um, in Ireland, you had a lot of uh, building societies until 2008, and then there was this famous crash, and only one building society, building society survived. But in England, the building societies are not doing this kind of basic principle business. Like I said, they are doing normal banking business, but they are corporately owned. What I'm representing is banks who are corporately financed. So people save, and they get a, co get a credit for housing or or cooperative share when they saved enough money. But we promise the customer to have a fixed interest rate on the saving and a fixed interest rate on the credit in order to have the security to finance um, the property. Around 40 million contracts are sold in the European Union. We are not so big like other banks, but um, in the countries where we are, the government is incentivizing people to save money for housing, for obtaining a cooperative share in the housing, um, in the cooperative housing stock, but also become more known as in at the end. So governments are incentivizing savings depending on the salary, how much you earn. So the government gives you a special bonus, which is helping consumers who are usually don't have usually don't have access to credit. So there are still some countries where the banking sector is not as developed, like in France or like in England or Netherlands. In these countries, consumers need to earn their own credit worthiness by saving regularly. They wouldn't get a normal credit from a normal bank. If you go to Romania, if you are a farmer, or if you are working in a factory and fixing or building cars, you will have a low salary, and most of the banks are not serving you. So these people have really a problem. They don't. They are not credit worthy because they don't have a credit history. They don't um, have enough salary in order to get a credit, so we're refusing to grant these people credits. So what we do, we come to these countries, we open up the building society sector and uh, help people for self-help to save the money and then get a credit for their property or for the collective share. So how does it work? It's really simple, basic borrowing banking. If you all want to, if you all want to be homeowner or you want to buy a, a share in a cooperative, but you don't have the money now. So you can go to the bank, but the banks will refuse you. So what we do, everybody gives me one euro today. So I have probably 50 people in the room. I have 50 euro today. And if the house would cost 50 euro, I will give it to some of you. So I will choose one of you. Of course, there is a legal principle and there are methods to prevent fraud, mathematical formulas, which are supervised by banking supervisors. And I can give you the first loan today and he can start building up a house. And tomorrow he will pay me one euro again, and you will give me another euro, and tomorrow maybe it's your turn to get the credit. So that's how it usually works. It's a collective closed fund system, which is under scrutiny by the banking supervisor in the countries where we're active, and we even have specialized laws that we should not do risky commercial business or investment business. So that's what, what's it about. So this is really typical boring banking in the old sense is a closed pool of deposit, safeguarded by protection, by specific rules that we are not able to gamble on the stock market, for example, and we need to be we need to get a security for the for the pro for the for the for the mortgage credit. So we register rights in the property in order to be safe and the consumer pays back and we have fixed interest rates agreed already in the beginning. So this is a typical 
mortgage credit for being homeowner. Interest rates in the Eurozone is quite low. For us, we offer even credits right now, Germany, Austria, with 1.5 interest rate for the mortgage credit, which is quite cheap. If you go to a normal bank, BNP Paribas or Deutsche Bank, Commerzbank, or Bortis, you might get, you might have to pay right, right now 4%, I guess, in Belgium, for 10 years fixed interest rate. So since we are independent from capital market, because it's a closed collective fund scheme, we can organize lower interest rates but the interest rate on the saving is also very low. So this is a disadvantage of the system. So you hedge, you hedge actually as a consumer, as a saver, the rights to get a cheap interest rate. You don't have to take the credit if you don't like it, or if you find another bank and the market offering you a cheaper interest rate, which can be tricky, as we saw it in the zero environment, zero interest rate environment, but um, we offer you the possibility. You have a security to have an option to get a credit for a low price. So that's how we do our business. And since we're here in the cooperative world, um, we are also financing cooperatives, we're financing cooperative owners, we financing shares for corporations or for cooperative owners by um, supporting them to help to, 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 to accumulate the savings in order to buy this cooperative share. But we're also financing cooperatives as such, the entity as such, in order to fix the building, in order to buy the building and so on. So we have certain quotas in our legislation focusing and restricting this kind of business because we should not do business only in this field. The main target is non-consumers, but we're also financing cooperative and cooperative ownership. In Germany, we even have quotas for that. So we grant big amount of contracts, volumes um, with a lower fee, and um, the, the advantage of this kind of closed collective fund scheme is that we don't charge early repayment compensation in case the consumer needs to pay back the loan earlier. So which is a big advantage. In some countries it is regulated, like in France, the early repayment is limited, but in some legislations not. So with this system, we don't have a damage as a banker when we get the money back earlier. So therefore we don't charge early repayment fees or early repayment compensation. Since I'm German, I was or we were looking into um, what is going on in Germany and the German KFW, which is a federal sportive bank, um, has certain programs on cooperative housing finance, which you probably know better than me because you're dealing with this all the time. Um, there are currently there's a program currently under this government, social democrat government, which we have um, granting consumers the possibilities to take up a loan as a cooperative owner up to hundred thousand euro with a really low interest rate organized by KFW in order to be corporate owner of an apartment or a building. So this is a program which uh, has been established by the Social Democrat government. Unfortunately, the volume of this program is only 10 million euro. It's actually peanuts if you think about how much money is needed, but at least it is a first step in the right direction. And I know the Minister of Housing in Germany she is really keen on supporting housing cooperatives. So if you are talking to the German government, probably now is the best time, the best government for you to convince, to get more support for cooperative housing, because our Minister of Housing, Mrs. Geibitz, she is really keen on supporting this specific idea of cooperative. Maybe we could argue, or maybe we could convince the EIB together in the next term to do something similar on the European level. The EB is currently focusing or has been focusing a lot on green finance and green deal. Now it's focusing on weapon financing, as uh, we mentioned it before. But maybe we can, in the next parliament, together convince lawmakers here in Brussels and the European Commission to focus more on this way of home ownership, cooperative home ownership, and get some support by the European Commission and especially the European Investment Bank. So I think this is um, something which we can do together. And I'm really keen to do that next term. And I hope that we have reasonable pol politicians in the parliament who will listen to us. So thank you very much for your attention. Yeah, I think this need of a good idea there. I know that um, we have a quick response planned from GBV from Austria. Um, it's going to just react to the to the um, Sparkasse model based on the 
Do you need a microphone? Yeah. Uh, yeah, thank you for the interesting presentation. Um, can you hear me now? Yeah. Uh, maybe I just want to, to add, because of these banks obviously also exist in Austria, but I uh, just want to add uh, another type of bank, which is more going into, into the direction of, of rental housing. Um, for those who might not be familiar with that, it's uh, they're called the Bombard Banken. Um, so it's 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 not uh, this, this type of closed pool system that uh, you have in Bauchbarkassen, but where you can actually put savings into like any anyone can put in savings a bit like the the French model, but uh, also a bit different. So you you uh, don't pay capital gains tax, and uh, and the savings on that basically is passed on to especially our members, also the cooperatives, uh, and with that interest rate reduction, they have to use that uh, to finance affordable housing. Um, and if you look at it historically, um, about half of all basically money that went into like the banking side into constructing affordable housing is actually used by generating funds from those uh, uh, bond banking. So it's quite a significant amount of, of money that has been collected from individual savings uh, with this sort of interest rate uh, reduction that has also benefited then directly cooperative uh, tenants. So. Mm -hmm. so the, Yes, thank you. And I think just sitting behind you, indeed, uh, Laurent Gekier, I, I don't ask you to speak now, but indeed you presented today. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, <laughs> the French model, which is also based on individual savings that is then used and uh, recycled in a, also a model based on solidarity to deliver social housing. So I think what our job indeed is to raise the profile of these different instruments that are actually giving citizens a choice and stability in um, in a housing market where um, and to show that there is another way to manage uh, to manage housing, um, we have a couple of questions coming through online, which I'm going to raise. But then we also have some time um, together before we um, before we hear from Lorenzo. And one of those questions, indeed, if Martin Lilia is still there, yes. So one of those questions was indeed on, um, she thanked you very much for the example, uh, and she wanted to inquire more about the level of participation of residents and to what extent it's a particip participatory process, um, how is that defined? And um, yeah, she wanted to hear a bit more detail about that. And then we have another question, Dom. So, and this is to everybody, what is the importance given to energy efficiency and energy quality? For all these cooperative homes discussed so far, ideally affordability, energy efficiency should come together. So, of course. So maybe, Martin, if you're there, you'd like to yeah. respond on the level of participation, which was indeed referred to. Yes. Um, I tried to give a comment on that. Um, uh, when um, you're talking about participation, members' participation in, in a cooperative, there is... Uh, a difference between small uh, and big cooperatives. It tends to be a, a, a bigger degree of participation in, in small cooperatives. And, but there is another side of the thing as well. Um, one can see um, uh, the more formal aspects of participation, taking part in the general assembly or perhaps taking place at the board and so on, do not attract so many. But um, the, the organization, the, the framework of, of a cooperative allows the cooperative to arrange a lot of other activities like um, um, yeah, gardening groups and uh, singing groups and uh, yeah, perhaps wine tasting and so on. And all those activities gives a participation and a social inclusiveness in, in the cooperative. Uh, so the the cooperative um, gives by by the way a framework for other activities, and uh, many cooperatives have also meeting rooms or common rooms, often equipped with a kitchen and so on. So um, uh, and in Swedish uh, in Riksbygden that's mandatory. Uh, uh, so that gives an uh, arena possibility for for the uh, for the members to to meet and uh, get together in a way that private landlords do not offer. Just a follow-up question. Um, 
a follow-up question on that, Martin. Recently, we've heard from many of our members that in their funding models, they do not receive funding for indeed common areas. So in the funding models that you are working with, that is not the case? Uh, no, uh, it's of course, if we um, uh, if we uh, were after, if we try to uh, get as much profit as possible, we could perhaps exclude those common rooms, for example. But since we believe that a long lasting good housing uh, uh, has to provide a social um, there are social aspects on it. And then for, for the, those reasons, we always create a, a common room uh, and uh, also other possibilities for activities beside that formal aspects of taking part in your cooperative. Indeed, good point. And indeed, this reference to the ecosystem, you mentioned that also when we had a preparatory call for this session. So the fact that housing cooperatives lend themselves to more collaboration with other types of cooperatives for social issues. And we heard also indeed the broader ecosystem with cooperative banking um, from Christian. And I've also seen examples of cooperative uh, construction um, sector as well. So it's a uh, yes. Yeah. <coughs> Anyway, I can speak now. <laughs> Just to precision after uh, what we have learned about. Okay. Thank you, sir, for your explain about financial opportunities. I just give you any further information how we can do such price. We can do such price because the <coughs> Foncier Mediterranean or cooperative has access to a special kind of loan, which is uh, called the Gaia loan, pre Gaia in French. It's the Bank of Territory, Bank de Territoire, who promote it. This loan is on 80 years long. So we buy the land with this kind of loan of 80 years long. And the rate, with the rate of, which is in France, livré et caisse d'épargne, which is a saving, personal saving, and the rate for this loan is the rate of the livré plus 0, 0,50%. So we can buy such land in such area, and we can promote this kind of social solution for all people. The key Thank point, you. if the finance framework is not right, often it's not possible to, to achieve these results. So it's a very important point and indeed brings us back to why we need to work at the EU level to improve it even more. Um, so just on the point on energy efficiency, if, if some of you would like to come back on that. Yes. <laughs> Thanks for the question. Uh, we said also this morning in the, in the during the working groups that energy efficiency is quite a crucial point that, that if we think about a Marshall plan as <laughs> our Laurent Ecker is suggesting uh, the issue of, of energy renewal is, is absolutely important. And to make uh, an example that uh, we have used also for the SHAPE EU con final conference, a European project that was uh, led by Housing Europe, um, uh, is about one of our cooperatives, but many of them are, are doing uh, such a such plan. Uh, the cooperative Abitare in Milan has used uh, this tax incentive that is called Super Bonus in Italy. And uh, this is a cooperative that uh, is, celebrate, is celebrating this year 130 years. Uh, so, uh, which means that uh, they have quite um, old housing stock. Uh, they have renewed uh, more, uh, almost all, all the stock. So, uh, they have made the energy retrofitting on more than 2,050 um, and 500 uh, dwellings, uh, investing uh, uh, 
to uh, 100,000 um, billions of uh, millions of euros sorry uh, and what uh, was important involving all the families more than uh, 700 families in the process with uh, with a co-design uh, uh, let's say yes process uh, so uh, we care a lot about energy and efficiency and we are investing a lot of money in that and and, and we think that again at european level it's it is quite important that housing europe is saying uh, that uh, the renovation wave uh, has to be followed up and a and cooperative can can use it indeed an, an inclusive renovation wave and do you have other other panelists would like to come back on the aspect of energy efficiency okay and are there any other questions coming from look yes at the back there Can you take it? Okay. I'm Christine and I come from Denmark. I have a question maybe to Alice because she was uh, gathering okay. in, or maybe to Sweden about the enrollment uh, procedure for cooperatives because we in Denmark uh, have special rules to increase uh, coherence among the inhabitants. Uh, there is exemption from the rules. Usually when you apply for non-profit housing, you stay in general waiting line and then the one who is uh, first gets housing first. For cooperatives, they actually can choose whom they want to have as their neighbors. And uh, the idea was good that people are feeling together, but now we're experiencing two problems with this. One problem is that this uh, cooperatives among elderly, we see that more uh, resource uh, uh, people with more resources are getting in there because those are the ones who are more interested and can motivate better for that. And then we're also seeing that they are also very similar age. And that's also a challenge because now they're aging together and younger people are not willing to come in because they will see that there will be a burden for them to carry this larger group of uh, other seniors who may be still 20 years older than them. So I was wondering if there are other models among those rental cooperatives which uh, were solving this successfully and still people were feeling like coherence and uh, large interaction with each other. Thank you. Thanks a lot. A key point, oh, sorry, your question was to Rosanna on the on how it works in Italy or, uh, or in general? To, to yeah, Alice, Alice, if she has a uh, hierarchy of models. So, thank you. I can yeah. have, if you want. Yeah. Go ahead, Martin. Yeah, uh, the Swedish cooperatives, they, they are working with a open membership model, but you have to prove that your economy uh, are strong enough to uh, fulfill the uh, the payments you, you have to the cooperatives. And um, if you are denied membership, uh, you can go to court. Uh, perhaps Sophia, I can see here, is... I can give some comments on that later on, uh, but the, the cooperative, the board of the cooperative does not have the last word on this. You can uh, get to court to to uh, if you are denied your membership, but the model is uh, very open, and um, except for one thing, uh, those cooperatives for elderly, of course, you have to be old, you have to be at least fifty five years, but except that, uh, it's a very open model. Thanks, Martin. And Alicia, do you want to talk about the comparison and the system? Are we? Yeah, just um, it's a very difficult question, actually, because I think there's a lot of uh, uh, different ways, also within the same countries, the way that cooperatives allocate their, their homes. It also depends on whether they manage the stock independently or link to some kind of public program, for example, supporting social of affordable housing that may have its own rules. Uh, and even at the local level, for instance, in some municipalities, you might have policies to try to balance certain trends like uh, aging of the population or maybe having a stronger mix of incomes. Um, at the same time, there are also projects which are born and uh, clearly have an objective from the start of having kind of intentional communities so that people basically join together based on a certain interest or a certain philosophy. For instance, there may be groups uh, 
that look for uh, extremely sustainable and environmentally friendly housing solutions. Others that are, for instance, groups of uh, uh, related to age, uh, elderly women, housing projects and things like that. So it's, it's very hard to reply, but I think overall as a, as a society and as a sector, we should definitely aim at having a, a social mix, whether it has to be uh, in one specific project or <coughs> it's more of a, of a broader uh, concept. I don't know. Does it yeah. Yes, and I think the briefing, though that's a good note to make sure in the briefing we have an overview in different, indeed of the different allocation uh, procedures. Yes, another question here? Then I think we wrap up. Yes, hi. My um, my name is uh, Stefan. Can I turn it off? Oh, maybe. You did automatically. <laughs> my name is Stefan. I'm from the Netherlands, and I research uh, cooperatives. And I have the sense that I'm in in two entirely different worlds here. There's one world present here that is about um, financing individual ownership, me and my little family unit, and individuality and um, survival in a world of scarcity. And there is a, a, a much longer also a cooperative movement, collaborative movement of social uh, collectives, of uh, co-housing, of uh, eco-villages, etc. It is also about uh, living together in, in the broader sense. And I hear some of that, and I hear some of the individu in individuality. So I'm, I'm not sure at what meeting I am here. Um, and I'm wondering how you see that. Is, is this about um, organizations organizing housing for, 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 for people, for consumers, with the word consumer? Or is this about the movement of people finding housing in some, some new forms? Oh, I think that oh. if we look at the, the, um, the cooperatives that I mentioned earlier on, that very strong, maybe even 100 years ago, it was very much based around the but home ownership model, but uh, communal management. Um, and we also have cooperatives in our membership that are purely based on rental or right of use. Um, and But what we, what, what we try to propose is um the need for the need to give people choice in different contexts i don't think it's um to the right approach to dictate a certain approach from from european level this is what indeed what we tell the institutions all the time and what is true that in 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 the areas for instance that were mentioned tourism areas with high levels of tourism where um local families can no longer um access home ownership in fact um um the type of financing described um, for individual home ownership can actually be what is missing. So I think we don't try, I think we see many different contexts in Europe, so rural and um, urban areas with, with um, different needs. But what, what we try to work towards is a vision for decent housing for all, and many of those solutions indeed have to be collaborative. And I think, mo I think most of those, what we outlined today, but it doesn't mean we rule out and the other option of giving people more affordable access to to home ownership, because I think what was mentioned, the fact that the the market is controlled by uh, by a small number of profit driven banks, is also an issue. It doesn't give the people the the choice and the fairness for that option. So I don't think it's one world or another. I think there's so many different different contexts and. I think what what we strive for indeed is a, is a Europe where people have a choice, and at the moment, unfortunately, the the choice for too many of us is the street at the moment. Um, so, uh, with rising homelessness, rising housing exclusion, but I think what we show is that there are other ways. There is another way, but we need the right context, the right financial instruments, and the right legislative framework. So it's a complex one, I agree. And hopefully we continue this conversation as well. So I'm, I'm going to let Lorenzo sum up. And hopefully we can still say, is it possible to stay a little bit for a drink afterwards? And there's still some coffee there. <laughs> People still have an appetite for coffee. Please. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. It's sum up seems pretty complicated, but I can give you some pointers. So um First of all, uh, I have to to 
bring the salutations from our team and our director that couldn't be here today, Agnes Matis. So I'm trying to replace her. Let's see if I can do a good job. Um, I'm Lorenzo Novaro. I work for Cooperatives Europe. Cooperatives Europe is the representative organization of cooperatives in Europe in general. So we are the intersectorial representation, as we call it. So we mostly work to uh, advocate for the cooperative model itself, uh, independently from the different economic sectors or the different activities that uh, cooperatives do, because there are co-ops in essentially any part of the economy in Europe. So very, very varied movement. So the, the, the last question can be, applied to a lot of other economic sectors uh, in cooperation. Uh, what we do is uh, represent uh, ops to, that are represented by our members. So uh, our members are currently, I think, 84 uh, from 33 European countries, so EU and uh, non-EU. Uh, one of the main uh, topics we work on is the uh, so-called uh, social economy ecosystem. So we try to support the emergence of the social economy as an actual uh, proper uh, part of the European economy. This latest legislature in the uh, European Commission Yes, okay. Uh, in the of the European Commission, uh, really changed the approach. Publication of the Social Economy Action Plan in December uh, two thousand and twenty one. So after the most uh, hard part of the uh, pandemic crisis, uh, we sat down to talk about how the social economy in Europe can evolve and especially how an approach can be harmonized between the different uh, uh, European countries because one of the main topics uh, regarding social economy at the moment in Europe is the different approach of the different member states. Uh, there are some that are much more advanced in the way they deal with the social economy initiatives and the enterprises acting in, in this field. Others that are much less prepared or uh, much. Maybe you need to change the microphone. Yeah. Take another one. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so the. <laughs> Wrong place. I don't know, maybe they switch off at 5 30. <laughs> I think you can stay without your voices. Yeah, yeah, sure. <laughs> Just for the online. I don't know if there is any, any mic. Oh, okay. Uh, no, better. Uh, so, yeah, the, the, the social economy action plan was really a moment that uh, changed the discussion at the European level, uh, and it had already a series of consequences, the publication. So we have more clear the action areas that were identified and we have a path to what could be the evolution of, of this. The first, uh, um, the first moment was when the uh, commission launched a cons uh, consultation called the pathways. So, uh, the first two were uh, dedicated to tourism and to social economy and proximity economy. Uh, the interesting thing for today, I think, is that touching the topic of proximity economy, they are starting to involve the civil society of Europe into a process of re-evaluating and uh, looking into the different modalities of urban living and also rural living and how the European citizens can shape their own habitat, let's say. Uh, the interesting thing is that the proximity economy it's, uh, is actually at the moment the least developed uh, policy point, but it's going to get a lot of attention 
So we expect for the new commission that will come up after the, uh, the elections in the next legislature to have more initiatives on this. Uh, the transition pathways are leading to groups and to other and to other discussions. So we hope that we will get contributions on this from the uh, housing cops and all the other all the other actors, so that we can uh, participate more in this discussion. Um, the tourism one is somehow linked. We touched upon that uh, um, a lot of times today. There are different aspects, especially on sustainability of tourism, uh, from the environmental point of view, but also from the uh, urbanism point of view and, and the life of the European citizens. So the two are, are quite interlinked and others will come. Uh, the other aspect that is definitely interesting for the discussions today and that we can try to follow together uh, is the uh, renovation of buildings and the um, renovation of the energetic profile of the real estate uh, in Europe in general. Uh, this aspect is interesting on a lot of different uh, uh, of, of different profiles. First of all, the fact that there is also another initiative from the European Commission uh, called the New European Bauhaus. I don't know how many are involved uh, in this. Uh, it's an interesting approach because it's trying to give like a, a European way of uh, of identifying certain kinds of needs and finding the, the solutions. I don't know how effective it is for now, but the ambitions are very high. And public bodies, uh, uh, local public bodies are very much involved in the process. So for the first time, we are seeing not only the usual uh, DGs, so the let's say ministries of of Europe involved, uh, but also DG Regio and all the uh, local territory uh, governance, very much involved uh, in this aspect uh, of renovation and going towards the green transition for what is the uh, enormous heritage and the enormous patrimony of buildings in Europe. There's also the topic uh, of energy itself, so energy consumption and energy production. On this, there is, for us working for cooperatives, a topic that is very interesting is the energy communities. Energy communities could be a way also to make homeowners or cooperative members uh, uh, and energy consumers because each of us is also an energy consumer in society. They could become producers or prosumers, as they call. Uh, and But this requires a lot of work on regulation because there is no harmonized way to regulate uh, uh, energy communities, not only in the member states, but even in the regions inside the member states. So there is a lot uh, to work there. Uh, some countries are getting more open to experimentation uh, and some others are looking for a, like a uniform regulation that is still to come. So on this, we are working uh, also with uh, with other cooperative sectors, RESCOP, for example, our uh, Renewable Energy Cooperatives uh, Association. So all of this is it's really a challenge. Uh, we are working to try and bring the voice of all kinds of cooperatives uh, to not only the European Commission, but also uh, the work with the Parliament. The, um, it was mentioned at the beginning when uh, MEP Toya was speaking, she mentioned the uh, social economy intergroup. A lot of work uh, has been done there, mostly behind the scenes to push for uh, new positions in the social economy. The parliament is always a quite slow process kind of uh, institution, but uh, a, lot, a lot was done. We hope that uh, in the new parliament there will be other opportunities for this. Uh, so we're definitely open, uh, open to that. Uh, I really think we can do a lot together. Uh, one step 
practical that can be uh, from here to the to the elections is the participation in the next uh, uh, consultations and the participation in pledges. So on the transition pathways, what the commission is looking for is pledges from civil society on some topics. And they are open also to uh, pledges from the same organization in different transition pathways. So maybe we could think of something connect connected to the proximity economy uh, and see if we can together push for uh, some significant points to be included uh, in uh, the future publications and in the directives that will necessarily have to be promoted by the next commission. So. We are at we are at the end, but a lot of what we are doing now will have to be uh, picked up in the next season. Thank you, Thank you very much, Alejandro. I'm a member of Corporates Europe. I really appreciate that you're keeping this other way yeah. of working on the map firmly at European level as well. So that's um, great to have you here today. And we need some of those ideas we can continue to work on. So I think it just leaves us to say thank you to all our panelists, to, to you for being here. I know it's been a long day for many of you. And also to SLRB. I don't know if anybody's here, but they host us. So SLRB is our member here in Brussels and they hosted us here today. And indeed, I think I just finished with the words, indeed, you inspired um, mentioning the new European Bauhaus. Mm -hmm. um, indeed, it's an interesting initiative launched at European level, but with three key words. <laughs> Um, sustainable, beautiful, together. And I think this word of together, it's just a point that we should constantly reinforce that housing indeed should not just be left up to the individual. If you're uh, priced out of the market, it is not necessarily your fault. If you are homeless on the street, it is not your fault. This is a societal question that we, we do have to solve together. And I think a lot of the answers of, of how to do that were mentioned here today, but we just have to scale it up. So thank you for being here. And and, and also to Andrea Naku for working very hard in, in the background preparing and Abdurrahim Pagdi also for the preparation of, of the event today. Am I forgetting somebody? <laughs> <laughs> thank you all. Thanks for the invitation. Yeah. <laughs> uh, maybe I can take a picture of you all together. Go back, then come back. Or he's maybe standing up. No, it's a little bit faster. Yeah, yeah. Free bird. In the front, we have our bird. In the front, yeah, I mean. I can with the screen behind. Yeah, okay. I know Lorenzo. I you know Lorenzo. <laughs> we work together in Italy. Oh, okay. Uh, actually, in the European Bows. Ah, okay. Uh, in the okay. okay. Region. I see. I see. Okay. Okay. I'm Diana from Housing Europe. No, but it's nice to be. I, I just join our uh, working yeah, meeting. Maybe I'll be. Maybe okay. have a new member or a new. Yeah, that's like. Yes. Yeah, I, will I don't join. Yeah, I also. I brought it back in the topic. I work with Yeah, I mean, I can. Probably... I don't know. So. <laughs> I try to. It's really If you're there earlier, I can. Yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah